Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is the other thing I do. My guest this week is Virginia Abramovich, a writer, producer, and director who's worked in film and television for two decades. Her first feature, Between Waves, which she co-wrote with Katherine Andrews, stars Fiona Graham as a woman who comes to believe her vanished partner may be alive and well in a parallel dimension and sets out to find her way back to him. After premiering at Whistler last December and playing the Canadian Film Festival earlier this spring, it's available on VOD in Canada as of today, and you should check it out. Virginia picked Memento, Christopher Nolan's 2000 thriller starring Guy Pearce as Leonard Shelby, a man who wants nothing more than to find the monster who murdered his wife. But thanks to a brain injury that's left Leonard unable to form new memories, all he has to go on is the information tattooed on his body. Except the more time we spend with Leonard, moving back and forth in his narrative, the less reliable his story seems. I mean, it's Memento. You know where it goes. This is someone else's movie. It was a great influence in, um, even when we, like, because I co-wrote this with Catherine Andrews when we started writing, we actually, like, it was just like one of the first references I had. I was like, I want, like, when I was, when we were going through the writing and I was explaining to her, like, how I saw the structure and I'm not copying the structure at all. It's a very different story, but... Mm -hmm. I said I saw it like Memento and I wanted it because it's a it's a character that um, isn't sure what's real and what's not. Um, I think I I don't know another film that pulls that off any better. Uh, yeah, so, it's a textbook case of the unreliable narrator and the unreliable film, right? Like it, because it is, Memento is doing two things differently and, and Between Waves sort of does as well. It's playing with both perspective and consciousness in a way that I mean I think it works really well I mean I'm trying I'm just basically trying not to step on anything and I don't want to spoil it for the for the audience the same way I spent I think a full year talking about memento in circles and just you know like telling people over and over again don't read my review don't <laughs> ask anybody why are you talking to me go see it because it is so you want to protect it you want to make sure people get the same experience that you did yeah, because it's an experience of like disc. Actually, I watched it with my son last night again because oh, yeah. I wanted to see it before speaking with you. And uh, he's fourteen, so he's never seen it. Okay. So it was just like, does it? You know, like is you know, do films like translate to a young like you know, do they do they hold their you know? And it's just he, he it finished and he just couldn't stop talking. No, oh, that's great. Yeah, and it's so, 21 years old now, which is kind of shocking. It will be, it played TIFF that year. So it will be pretty much 21 years to the week when this episode comes out, which is just horrifying wow. to me because I saw it there and I'm oh, wow. very, awesome. very old. Uh, awesome. When did you first catch the film? Uh, I saw it in the theaters, but after TIFF for sure. Mm. So it, it was, pro well, probably around a similar time. Yeah, I think it came out fairly quickly after. Um. Because I, I don't remember exactly the, the but I was just, uh, I've seen it many times since because it, it just blew my mind. I kind of walked out going, whoa. <laughs> um, so regardless, it's a great film. Uh, if I hadn't based, not, it's not based, my film was not based on, it was just, um, we looked at it as, as structure, a structure that's de unstructured mm -hmm. as a, you know, a, in many ways, like the, the, the care, the, I don't know, Christopher Nolan and the way he plays with time in, in, in his other films too. Like he's just like a master of, you know, messing with your head that way. Um, so just, uh, um, yeah. 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 He has a real structural, I was going to say an intuitive structure thing, but what his movies do is teach you how to watch them by disorienting you. Right. Like you, you're thrown in the shallow end in so Memento because you've got the yeah. color coding, but then in something like Insomnia or uh, Batman Begins, where it's basically, I don't care if you know when this is happening, you'll figure it out. And then the, the natural momentum that he gives to his movies, this just came up in an episode about the prestige. He manages to leave you at the end of every film feeling absolutely thrilled and energized and excited even if it's the most downbeat, like Memento is not a happy ending. It's just, it ends in a terrible place, but you come out of it so excited and jazzed to see what this guy's going to do next. And then 
will he deliver on the promise of, because I hadn't seen following until after Memento. I missed it. I think it played the festival as well, but I didn't see it. And it's similarly, it's a slippery psychological thriller sort of, but in, in a very minor key compared to Memento. Memento is an incredibly ambitious film. Um, and you come out of it thinking, oh, I've seen, this is as, this is as essential a development in cinema as what? Fight Club and Magnolia and Three Kings and Being John Malcolm, like that indie wave the year before produced this and we're ready for it. The color, the color coding, color and black and white stuff is ingenious. The performances are great. I love the fact that it's funny that, that in the middle of all of this awful stuff that there are moments where you can't help but laugh. Yes. And it ends with this, I'm still trying not to say anything. Uh, It ends with this awful revelation that what we've been seeing, you know, it's all, it's all real ish. Everything we've seen has happened, but the motivation is different. And the idea too, that stuck with me for years was that this is a film about a man who has given himself a psychosis in order not to cope with, or in order to not confront his responsibility for things. And it's, it's so painful that within minutes after the film, it's like, well, I guess I get it. I totally understand why that would work emotionally, why this film went the way it did, but it's, yeah, it's so, it's so incredibly bleak. And, and weirdly for Nolan, it's still emotionally rich. A lot of his films tend to be a little colder and more cerebral, but this one just, it's sad. It's so sad. Yeah. It's very personal to the way it's shot as well. Like very, like really close, really mm-hmm. attention to detail and that like very like you're, you're, there's not a lot, there's not a lot of wides. It's really like, it's just like kind of, you know, um, which is not how my film is shot, but um, yeah, but no, I was going to say it's a very, it's a very, very like you're, you're just confronted with these characters and not a lot of characters, right? Like very sparse, not a lot of locations. Like it's, it's, I don't know. It's um it truly is like a masterfully written and told story. Yeah. It had no money. And, you know, their uh, prosthetics are sort of a couple of gunshot effects. There's, there, it's all very small. Uh, it took, I think, oh yeah, it was shot in 25 days. I just confirmed that. I knew it was shot over a month, but it was 25 day shooting schedule. And Pierce was on set every day because like, he's basically in every frame <laughs> with the exception of some of the Sammy Jenkins stuff. Um, and it's, it's just, it doesn't feel like a low budget movie. I think because of the the ambition of it, because all it is is color and, and black and white stock. That's that's the trick. That is the biggest special effect in the film. Yeah. And and dialogue and layering and the performances and Guy Pierce, who was not the first choice for the film, I found this out and was just interesting because I can't picture anybody else yeah. in that role. But originally it was going to be you won't believe this Brad Pitt. Oh. I can see that though. Yeah, in, in two thousand it could work. It, but but yeah, in two thousand I could see that. Uh, but I I think he got the better pick. Yeah, he also he but he wanted um, like he wanted a, a a a handsome blonde actor because the other two options apparently were Aaron Eckhart and Thomas Jane, who are kind of interchangeable at that point in that mode. Mm-hmm. And then he ended up going with Guy Pierce, who is a dark haired small. Australian bodybuilder at the time. I mean, he'd made, uh, he'd made Ellie confidential, but he was still kind of coming into his own as an actor. Mm-hmm. And this role is like, it's the one I always identify with him so completely absolutely. because he is just, he is the film. Yeah, absolutely. And he's surrounded by you know, like wonderful character actors. Half the cast is from the matrix, which is this weird coincidence that, that Carrie Ann Moss and Joe Pantoliano were available and interested. Um, and again, it just feels, it doesn't feel like a Matrix reunion. I, I am constantly surprised thinking about my first viewing and how I just never thought about it. Uh, and it was the biggest film in the world a year earlier. Right. But um, they're just character actors and they're perfectly cast. They're, they're like Carrie Ann Moss hits that amazing noir thing of, of being a femme fatale without actually feeling like she's being exploited. Like the, the, the character is very consciously exploiting herself um mm-hmm. by playing that role and that's cool and pantoliano is the guy you just can't wait to get shot so by doing that in the very first <laughs> it's yeah. 
great. Yeah, yeah, it's just there's this sense of play and the sense of the history of noir running around inside of this high concept um, character study that's also sort of a thriller. Yeah, and it's a, it's a detective story, mm-hmm. right? Like there's like this it's, absolutely, and you're you're in it for that detective ride. So it's it's got so much great layers of um, like. There's a, yeah, I don't know. It's um, so it was, it was actually really nice to watch it again yesterday. Um, and then also see my, my son's reaction to it. Yeah. Cause, I'm... Cause it was fresh. It was, it was, you know, um, and, and sometimes I'll, I mean, I do that, you know, you're, you know, I love films. So I'm always like, okay, you know, I pull my kids in, we watch something. And sometimes I'm like, Oh, they're like, you like that film back then. Really? <laughs> and I won't name any. Oh, um, I gotta know. Uh, well, I, okay, 16 we, Candles was, I was embarrassed. Yeah, I can see that. It's so it's, it was, I, I was embarrassed. I Has was not aged well. Yeah. No, it's not. It's, it's got, you know, it's, it's very sexist. It's kind of, I don't know. I watched it again. I was like, yeah, I got to cross that off my list. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It's, there's this, this whole thing now with eighties movies that we grew up loving. Although I was more of a breakfast club guy than the 16 Candles guy. But although breakfast, that trend that that still holds it does right yeah. like it's the, that because still yeah the flaws are the point the characters are like well the whole point of it is these are not always great people to each other 16 candles is way more idealized in that uncomfortable way now where you really have to reckon with oh john hughes was still kind of in national lampoon mode with a lot of the the racial stuff and the and the really creepy rapey stuff that 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 yeah. circles the whole thing yeah. yeah. So, Don't watch National Lampoon's Vacation, by the way. That that has not aged well at all. Oh, interesting. Because <laughs> as you said it, I was like, oh, I haven't seen that in a long time. Yeah. Good. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks no, for that it's, tip. <laughs> it's weird. There's going to be a whole new, there There should be. I wish video stores were still around because you could create a whole problematic section now and it would be filled <laughs> with 70s and 80s comedies. Oh, that's great. Just um, filled with them. I, oh, that's, yeah, I know. It's very sad. Um, I used to, I remember... Um, used to walk into suspect video and I just go like, I'm in the mood for a foreign film. It was almost like picking out a wine, right? With like some comedy, but blah, blah, blah. And, and they'd go, oh, oh, I got one for you, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. I wonder how many people found Memento that way because it's not something you go looking for, right? Like it's a very specific vintage to use your uh, uh, metaphor. Uh, um, oh, I miss video I don't stores. Know. Oh, yes. That's, that's what I, yeah, that's... I do miss video stores and just looking through like to actually see the covers and touch them and you'd go through the catalogs and um, yeah. anyways. Yeah. A lot of people respond really well to this when it pops up in a Skype window. I love it. Just because yeah, you're never, as long as there's power in the house, I can watch whatever I goddamn want. That is <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm trying to come up with a, a hook on Memento that works for the video conversation, but it doesn't really. Um, but it is a movie that that became successful after its theatrical release. Um, it was a it was a huge hit on DVD. It was a one of Sony's first really weird elaborate special editions. There's a version that looks like Leonard Shelby's medical dossier and it's a two disc thing with a flip up cover and it's that's where the uh, the chronological version of the film is hidden the first time. Okay, that's so cool. Yeah. It's just it would just be cool to like after you watch it, not before. Yeah. Yeah, that was the thing. Like people were saying immediately, oh, boy, I wish I could watch that in chronological order. It would be so different. It's like, yes, it would be so different. The, the emotional climax would be in the middle of the film. And there's a reason, there are so many, and this, is, this dates me more than anything. Um, but I used to hang around on Usenet in the olden days on news groups uh, just because I was single and it was the late 90s and that's what happened. <laughs> Talking about like rec art movies, current films, I think. Um, and all video DVD and all those old groups that are so, so gone. But Memento was a really busy topic. There were mm. arguments about it. They would basically be like um, uh, comment sections now on, on the review. Mm. People refused to believe, and I thought this was fascinating, that the ending is definitive. They rejected Teddy's explanation at the end of the film uh, and refused to believe it, that Teddy was just trying to trick Leonard. And wow. Well, so what did they think he was doing? I don't remember the exact arguments because I got so angry at them. I dismissed them out of <laughs> hand. (Laughter) 
my take is this is why that scene is at the end of the film. The whole point of this is that this is a mystery and that's the answer. The explanation is coming from Teddy. Whether Leonard believes it or not is irrelevant, but that was it. They identified so much with Leonard that they couldn't accept that Teddy was telling him that te Teddy had been using him the whole time and that everything, uh, that there is no John G and that he's just, and, it, and it, it is a magnificent noir finale, the hero finding out that he's the villain. Uh, mm -hmm. And the thing that makes it truly great, I think, is Nolan's decision to make the hero find out that he's the villain and decide he doesn't care because it's the only thing that gives his life meaning. Yeah. That's that's amazing. And and uh, people were saying that that, you know, what is it that they, um, that this, the ending, it doesn't make sense because then Leonard doesn't have the condition that he says he has. It's like, that's right. Leonard doesn't have the condition that he says he has. He has something else and it's, he's forced himself to do this. And people just rejected it out of hand because they could not accept that Leonard wasn't the good guy. And they would point to other things about Sammy Jenkins and how that had to be real. And it, it is like Teddy says, it's a real case, but it's not the case that Leonard says it is that's mm -hmm. that was Leonard and that's the and the film shows us in the flashback and the argument was no 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 Leonard's just imagining that while, while Teddy is saying it it's an illustration it's like but 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 to to completely ignore the structure of the movie because you like the hero and don't want him to be the bad guy I was going to say that was shocking to me now but it isn't because that's how people respond to culture now there there's all this fan rejection of stuff and the snyder cult and and the argument that the meaning is imposed by the viewer and certainly we get to make inferences and and we get to interpret but memento is not a movie that holds up to that example memento pretty much is what it is right like that's the fun of it that's the the great uh sizzle that you get while you're watching it when it's unfolding and the first time um i mean i i kind of felt like it was going to have a downbeat ending when i saw it because it's that kind of movie mm -hmm. you know his wife's not going to suddenly be alive anywhere that's not going to happen um although i guess technically but um when it ends it's great because you've been in the hands of a master you've been watching this movie that is a perfect noir reconstructed from memories of other noirs and, and other and the history of film, like decades of film history have led to this point. And it plays, it's the other thing that Nolan's films do, which is that they, they recreate a certain type of experience in order to make you feel clever that you're catching it, right? Like that uh, mm. the idea that the bank heist at the beginning of dark Knight is riffing on heat. It's fine. It does its own thing. It doesn't, just rip it off, which is the point, but also that you can catch the references and, oh, wow, this is what if Michael Mann made a Batman movie? Cool. <laughs> um, and when Memento landed, though, it was a new trick. And yeah, I just bounced out of that movie. I think I saw it at like 1.30 in the afternoon on the first day of TIFF at a press screening. Mm. Um, but I remember that and nothing. I would have seen five movies that day. The only one I remember is Memento. Oh, I could understand that completely. Completely. It, it's it's one of those things that I like those movies that you could watch again and watch again and then find something else and it's it's such a it's such a crafted um, piece of work yeah and how often do you revisit it I mean do you come back to it a lot now or how long has it been since the last time before last night uh, probably like two years well well now it's been two years it's been like three years ago when when Katie and I watched it um, before we as we were figuring out how to structure uh, the story of, and it's not, again, it's not, I didn't copy the structure at all, but I just wanted to see, like we, you know, we both watched it and then um, kind of like looked at how it was broken down in the way that um, things were revealed. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was watching it, it way more, um, you know, with way more intention than I've ever done before, not as a passive viewer. Right. right. Cause um and and then just realizing how much more I loved it even more. <laughs> so um, because and you could see like there's been so much craft and thought put into it. Um, with you know, and 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 it starts with the story. So I think that's that's the thing that um, everything else, like if you don't have a great, like a good story with with these great characters, then I you know, you you couldn't you can't do anything, right? So so that's so anyway, so that so it was like about 
I guess about three. Well, maybe it's been four years now. I'm trying to think of how because it's yeah, time has absolutely no meaning anymore. Yeah, it's weird. But yeah, but the the last time I saw it was before we started to um, like we we had you know we were like you know drafting out the story. Right. Um, So, what does watching it non passively? Uh, I don't know. What does an active watch of Memento feel like? Did you tell, like, were you taking notes? I want to know this experience because it's fascinating to me. Um, yeah, like we, we kind of broke it down. So I um, kind of, yeah, with, with, you know, notes and like, okay, this is where something's happening. This is how he's doing it. This is, and then we, and then we talked about it um, in, in more than just um like a film lover's way, like, sure, oh, yeah. it's really cool. You know, the characters, we just like talked about it, like, uh, like storytellers um, in, in the, you know, and um, Katie is really awesome. Cause she's, she's a very good writer. Uh, and uh, she, you know, she was like, okay, this is the first act. This is the second act. And she had it all figured out in that, in that looking at it in that way of where, where things happen. And I can't tell you right now, I can't specifically tell you how, how we broke it out, but um, but it also when you do something like that, you realize how how clever something is. Like how, when it's written well, all the things that are set up in yeah. places that you know resonate afterwards because it's it's not an accident. Like everything that's said in that film, everything that it's it's set up in a in a you know with intention. Yeah, I love the uh, experience of defending it because it made me discover all the linkage myself. It was just, someone said, um, how come Leonard knows you have to burn Polaroids? It's like, well, he was a private investigator for years. He would know that that's in the older memory. It's not that he can't, he can't make new ones. And you have to keep explaining that. And in the act of saying he can't make new memories, you suddenly realize, oh, but he knows this thing. And you know, like the Sammy Jenkins thing, he shouldn't be able to provide a context for that because while Sammy Jenkins was a previous experience, he refuses to acknowledge that Sammy was faking it. Like that's the the big revelation. So yeah. he's, he's reworking that memory as it goes. And that's the other thing that has come out in the last 10 years scientifically, uh, thanks to horseshit like the Mandela effect, where, you know, people refuse to acknowledge that they were wrong about remembering something. And it goes on. It's called the Mandela effect because um, when Nelson Mandela's death was announced, there were people who were convinced he died years earlier. And I have no idea why that is, but they just, you, you, you like the greatest, I'm sorry. The greatest thing about being an adult is that you can say, oh, I must've got that wrong. And no one will be mad at you unless, you know, it's, you're doing it in the middle of a trial or something. Um, <laughs> but Memento is an example of how the Mandela effect works even before we knew what it was called, because Leonard is doubling down on a falsehood unconsciously uh, to to make himself the hero of his story when he is absolutely not. But yeah, take a look at the, look up the Mandela effect sometime. All you have to do is Google Shaq genie movie and you'll find it within like two clicks. Uh, John Wilson did an amazing half hour on it in his uh, series, how to with John Wilson, an HBO series that ran last year. I think it was last year. It might've been this year. This is my point. Um, (laughs) But it, it has only just hit me now that that was the people arguing that that couldn't be it was the same sort of thing. It's the obstinacy of no, this is what I think it is, and I refuse to check. I refuse to to be well. Yeah, persuaded. you know the um, the uh, it's like a in in it's a Sanskrit saying, "You are what you think, having become what you thought." Okay. Um, I think it's a perfect example of that. So yeah. in the end. You and, and and with with the with Memento, I think it's a great example of that too, where he becomes he convinces himself he becomes what he thought. Yeah, what he, what he wants to think, he's he, that that becomes your truth. Yeah, and and Teddy is saying that the whole time that that great refrain like that's who you were, um, is is it's a perfect noir phrase. It's a, the tragedy that you're not that person anymore, but you've become something else. And I, I use that thing. And then in the end, like the, what are the last, the last words in the film are, yes, I will. And, and Pierce delivers it beautifully with just this sort of little mordant sense of satisfaction that this is going, this is his life now and it's fine. And he's proving Teddy right, even though, you know, theoretically he won't remember that he's the one who told him that and also that he killed him 
Um, but I yes. think, yeah, but I think that's the most noir thing of all, just that, that incredible flourish from the film telling you, no, no, this is where it was always going. This is the only place it could have ever gone. And then people just refuse to accept it on the internet because people on the internet are the worst. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Good times. <laughs> It's a rabbit hole, right? You just it's you a, get... it's totally a rabbit hole, and but it's I guess my yeah I'm glad I I was like what film but it just can't like that and and the other film that really was an Inception, mm. that, but they're both his films. It's funny how it was like um, yeah, and Inception is I think pretty aggressively tied to Memento, right? Because they're both about the fragility of memory and how in the end. Um, Leonard incepts himself, right? I mean, if you want to, without any of the tech, I wonder if that's it. <laughs> that is so great. Yeah. It was just Nolan rattling around for another idea. And it's like, you know what would be cool if you had a machine that did that? Um, I do love Inception. It's ridiculous. It's so complicated. And it's it's the argument for and against why Christopher Nolan shouldn't make a Bond movie. Because he already has. Like, that's the end. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. He They're has, running yeah. around inside on Her Majesty's Secret Service. That's the point of it. Yeah. Um, and again, it's that that's exactly what I was talking about. It, it makes you feel like you are smart because you caught that, because this is a thing I recognize and, and he's doing something completely different with it and recontextualizing it. But yeah, he wants to make his Bond movie and this is it. And then subsequent films, I think, just demonstrate that he he probably shouldn't do a proper Bond film because I don't think he'd care about Bond. I mean, look at the way he treats the protagonist in uh, literally in Tenet, where his character is almost irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is like the ideal James Bond from the Connery age, where he is kind of just a thug who's going in and disrupting stuff. But now Bond, after Daniel Craig, I think you have a higher uh, level of, of character investment in the concept of James Bond. And I don't know that Nolan is interested in that. I think he he's having more fun on his own terms, doing his own thing. Absolutely. And he's great at it. So Yeah. <laughs> Plus a Bond film from Christopher Nolan would cost like half a billion dollars. There's no way it can make its money back. <laughs> Technical impossibility. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so um we've kind of already covered it, but I'm I'm intrigued if there's a different angle. Uh the last question, the closing question on the podcast is always what of the film you chose, what of Memento have you used, borrowed, lifted, outright stolen, whatever. Uh, inspiration you might have taken, but does it show up in your other work as well? Is there another place that that it's echoing? Not, not in my other work. Well, the stuff I stuff I do that's director for hire is very different. Sure. So um, that that's you know scripts that are written by other people that have a very particular style of shooting and everything. So that's not. But um, I right now I've got a script that um, has just gone into the that uh, writing lab in, in New York that's a uh, champion by Meryl Streep. And, oh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, Nicole Kidman and Oprah. Um, so Katie and I are the same co-writer. Sorry, Catherine Andrews. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's, it's still, it's a sci-fi film, but it's, um, it's different and it's linear. So um, looking, at, looking at other ideas, but uh, what have I lifted? I don't know, uh, but I but the ending of Between Waves is a definite nod to Inception. Oh yeah, that's my okay. Can't discuss it, but yeah, 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 yeah. I see it. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> it's... That's my. So all right, we won't speak of it, uh, <laughs> but yeah, people will find it for themselves, I think, and they'll, they'll appreciate <laughs> it. My thanks to Virginia Abramovich whose first feature, Between Waves, is available on VOD today. Thanks also to Jen Paris. She knows what she did. You can find Virginia on Twitter at V underscore Abramovich, and you can find Memento on Blu-ray and DVD from Samuel Goldwyn Films. It's also streaming on Hoopla and Tubi, and on Prime Video in Canada, and Canopy, Roku, and IMDb TV in the US, and it's around on VOD platforms as well. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com, where I'm hosting a bunch of podcasts these days and recovering from TIFF. And you can find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. Our theme song is by The Last Year. If you like it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been enjoying us. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're there. 
watch movies, stay safe, wear a mask if you go out, get your shot if you can. I'll see you next time.